Projects are worth 10% of your total grade. I give you some project ideas. Where's the project folder? Oh, down there at the bottom. My project ideas go from what I consider easy to harder. Now, if you look at the first one and you think, well, that's insanely hard, I can't really help that. But you can also come up with your own project ideas. The goal is to not come up with something that requires you to work 20 hours a day, you know, for six weeks to get it done. I just want to give you some freedom to implement something a little bit um, outside of the realm of our usual programs because our usual programs are usually pretty small, right? Pretty small and targeted. So let me give you an example. And this is a big document, and I'm probably going to split it up into like six little documents. You know, project idea A, project idea B, C, and so on. Well, let's take a look. You can get an idea of the kind of stuff that I'm thinking. So here's one. Write a program that will implement a Caesar's cipher. Now the idea behind Caesar's cipher is imagine that you had a code, a, a document that you wanted to send to your, you know, your best ally in Germany. And so it had some text in it, you know, attack at dawn, right? And then you were going to shift it in order to make the text impossible to read by somebody who didn't know what the code was. So say we were going to shift everything to the right by one. And when I say to the right, if we were going to add one to all the values. All right, so after we were done, B would become C. Excuse me, A would become B. B would become C. C would become D. I'm going to leave spaces alone. Now for the word attack. B, what's one after T? Q, R, S, T, U, U, B, what's one after C? Is a D, H, I, J, K, L, right? A's or B's, Q, R, S, T's or U's. All right, and then one after D is E, one after A is B, W, X, right? And then one after N, L, M, N, O. Now let's say that there was one more word, zebra, for some reason. Caesar like zebras. Okay, so if you go past the end of the alphabet, you have to wrap around back to the beginning. So a Z becomes an A, while an E becomes an F, and a B becomes a C, and R becomes an S, and an A becomes a B, right? So I may have done this wrong. For one thing, um, zebra has only five letters in it, rather than six, so I don't know what I did wrong there. There. Anyways, so that's a shift of one. You could shift backwards if you wanted to. We could take the same sentence and shift backwards. Now, my brain doesn't work this well. But I know that a, a shifted back one goes off the edge of the map, so it has to turn around and become a Z, right? So that's a Z, and a B becomes an A, and a C becomes a B, and an A becomes a what? Z. And T's become... S is right, and C's become B's, and so on, right? And so that's shifting minus one. But you could shift by 10, you could shift by 5, you know, you can shift by 26, you could shift by 1,000, but, you know, you'd be counting over and over and over, you know, to, uh, to figure that out. So that's Caesar's cipher. So write a program that will implement Caesar Cipher. It should ask for input and a value to shift by. It will then output the result where every character has been shifted by that value. Now when we say shifted by that value, in this case, what are we going to do? We're going to get its ASCII value, like the ASCII value for A is 65. And then if you were going to shift it up 2, you would add 2 to that value, and that becomes a 67. And then if you converted it back, the 67 is a C, so that A got changed from a 65 to a, six, to a, from an A to a C. So, example, input, and output. What is the input? I love my ABCs. Shift by what value? Minus 1. Result shifted by, okay, so, you know, I become H, L become K. I hope I did this right. I had the wrong answer down here, so I did it in my head rather than running it through my program. I may have made a mistake. Note that you can make a simple cipher that ignores punctuation. 
and shifts only the letters. Now that's what I did here, right? I left my spaces alone. Or you can shift over the entire ASCII character range, right? Because if we go back to ASCIItable.com, you know, if we start at, the, the printable characters start at uh, decimal character 32, which is the space. The printable characters stop at 126. So you could use that as your wraparound point, right? So if it's you, but we're supposed to add 17 to it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and go back 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, like that. I'd like to see you implement that. On the other hand, when I wrote it this afternoon as a, as a, a demonstration, um, I went out and only did capital letters, and anything that wasn't a capital letter, I just printed as is. So the only thing you saw were spaces, but if I had lowercase letters or other punctuation, they also would have. So I kind of went that on that one. If you need help on the formula, I can give help to you. I have additional documentation that I've made up for other classes on uh, how to do the Caesar cipher. I could give you pseudocode for it or Python code or something like that. I'd like for you to try it yourself. Once you have that done, I'd like for you to modify so that instead of just giving a shift value, you give a shift range, right? I want you to start shifting at minus 5 and shift all the way up to plus 5. So take this phrase, any zebra, and do that to it, okay? We'll shift at minus 5, it looks like that. Shift at minus 4, it looks like that. 3, 2, 1, 0, right? If you shift neither to the left nor to the right, it's just your starting phrase. And we can see that as you shift 1, 2, and 3, A's become B's, become C's, become D's, and N's become O's, becomes P's. Z's wrap around and become A's, and so on. That's doing the simple one that does letters only, right? All righty, so that's a Caesar cipher. Here's another one. Exclusive or transformations. Now, you may have heard that during World War II, um, the Germans had codes called the Enigma. Enigma codes because they were almost impossible to crack. Well, that's what they called their machine. I don't know if they used a German word for Enigma or whatever. But it was based on the idea of exclusive ores. I think we talked about exclusive ores a little bit. Now, it was an extraordinary, complicated way of calculating exclusive ores. But what it would do is it would change the bits of the letters based on, by exclusive oring it against a value. Now, that value was calculated based on wheels. You know, um, the first value may have been, you know, one of any 27 numbers, and the second value may have been one of any 42 numbers, and so on. But anyways, it was exclusive value. And you're thinking bits in 1939, in 1942? That's pretty wild. Yeah, actually, you know, all this stuff was invented before computer. Well, when I say all this stuff, you know, character codes were invented before computers. Why? Well, for one thing, you had Morse code, but, but that's not it. Teletype, right? In the old black and white movies, you know, and you're getting your stock report based on teletypes, you know, and, you're, and how did those things get transferred? They got transferred over telephone. And so the letters had to be punched in. They had to be converted to zeros and ones, sent down the telephone line where another machine would turn them back into letters and print them out. Kind of like, you know, essentially the precursor to fax machines. So a lot of... Computer technology and codes and stuff like that came from adaptations of the teletype machines. So anyways, the Germans certainly had teletype machines. They certainly had the idea of bits, and they figured out what exclusive or, you know, that you could exclusive or a value and to turn it into something unrecognizable. Now, what does that mean? Well, I've talked about ors and ands and stuff, and I think I even mentioned exclusive or at a certain point. I'm going to go ahead and do the truth table for OR again. So if you have 0, 0, you have 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. OR means one side, at least one bit has to be set for the result to be true. So is that true or false? False. That's false and the rest of them are true. AND means both sides have to be lit. So there we go. Both of them have to be lit. So that was a false. 
That's also false because only one side lit up. So is that one. And finally we get our one that, okay, now exclusive or is a little bit different. It means one and only one bit. Not one or more, like truth means. Excuse me, like or means. It means one and only one. So, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. The only cases that are true are these two. These are not true. Okay. So, why would you exclusive or some numbers against some other numbers? Well, like if we were going to do ors, I've already done this before. Like if we have that number and we or it against that. Well, zero and zero or to zero. One and one or to one. How about zero and one? Zero and one or to what? One. Right. And then one and one or to one and zero. Is, okay, so yeah, that's great. There's no way to reverse that process, right? We cannot or this against some value to get back to our original data. So or wouldn't work. And is not a good idea either. So I'm just going to say that and wouldn't work. I'm not going to even show you the demonstration. Exclusive or does. If that's our original, and this is the value we're going to exclusive or it against, well, if one and only one bit can be set for it to result in true, then that's a false because neither one are set. This is a false because both of them are set. That's a true because one and only one is set. That's a false and that's a false. Okay, great. But what if we take this and we exclusive or it again against the original value, right? That one. We're gonna, that goof. Thanks. I would have gotten very frustrated in just a moment. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to exclusive or them again. Zero exclusive or zero is what? Zero. Zero exclusive or one is? One. What is one exclusive or one? Zero. Yep. Yeah. And so zero one is one and zero zero is zero. Okay. We got back to our original data. So if you exclusive or against a value, any value, and then you exclusive or against that value again, you get your original value. So maybe you can see why that would make for a good form or a good part of code, right? Because you could take a phrase, you could render it in a series of zeros and ones, and then you could apply some exclusive ors, probably not all of against the same numbers. That'd be too easy to crack. You know, maybe against a phrase, you know, a, another set of numbers, as what the Germans did is they did a series of, you know, quasi-random numbers. That's why the English um, developed computers in the, uh, in, during World War II was to crack German codes. The Americans developed computers in order to calculate and build better weapons, right? You know, nuclear bombs and artillery tables and stuff like that. Plenty of different distinction, but they both, you know, advanced computer science quite a bit. So anyways, now that you know what exclusive or is, let's go back to our write a program that lets the user enter a string and runs a series of transformations. I'm just going to go straight to the table rather than reading off these things and then show you the table. So what is the input? That's our input. So it prints this out and then it prints the ASCII values of that. You can just look them up and A is a 65 and a B is a 66 and so on. And then we're going to OR those values against 111. I arbitrarily chose 111. You know, you could make it ask for input if you wanted to. But. And so these values or against that result in these, but if you take these values and OR them against 111 again, you get back to your original values, and then OR them sequentially, excuse me, exclusive OR them sequentially, OR that one again, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on, right? So that's sequentially. So you're going to get different results than when we OR them against 111, right? The first one doesn't change at all, apparently, 65 stays 65. When we OR something against 1, it changes a little bit. When we OR something against anyways, you see what I mean? It's, and then we take this data and we exclusive OR it again against the same numbers. So we exclusive OR that one against 0 and get that one. We exclusive OR that one against 1. We get that one. We exclusive OR that one against 2 and we get that one. And again, we get back to our original data. 
and then printing out the string of the last result just so that we can see it again from eyeballer. Okay, so that's project two. Alrighty, Hangman. Write a program that lets the user play Hangman. Now this wound up being harder in Java for me than it probably should have. I don't know why it took me several hours, you know, to write this, but it shouldn't have been that hard. And don't Google up a solution. Don't Google up somebody else's solution of Hangman and turn it in. I'll probably be able to tell that it's not your coding. Anyways, we know what Hangman is like, right? I'm thinking of a word. It's seven letters long. Guess a letter. Be careful. You can only make eight mistakes. I'm going to guess A. Okay, now guess what? My word is actually the word Hangman. So we guessed A, and it put an A there and a there. Guess a B. Incorrect. Correct. You can only make seven more mistakes. So it hasn't changed. Guess a C. Incorrect, you can only make six more mistakes. Guess a G. Yep, there is a G in it. Guess an N. Yep, there's an N in it. Now you don't have to draw a little picture of a guy being hung, right? You know. <laughs> so anyways, they guess a D. There's no D in it. And they're not smart enough to figure out that this is supposed to be hangman. Guess an E. Guess an H. Okay, we're almost got it all filled in and we're smart. So we guess an M and it prints it out. You've won. All right, now maybe you played a game called Mastermind when you were a kid. Maybe it had another name. Yeah. The idea behind Mastermind is that one person has creates a little code by arranging pegs of four colors, and then the other person has to guess that code by arranging their pegs of four colors. And if they get a peg in the right position... Right, like here's a red one, it's in the right position, and here's a black one in the right position, then they get told you got two correct. If they get the color right, but they get it in the wrong position, like it definitely has a red, it doesn't, and it definitely has a green, so we're going to say two of them are valid but misplaced. And then you have to kind of figure out, what are you going to do about that one? Well, you know, one of the reds counts as valid but misplaced, and that means that the other red one doesn't count as all, at all. And so the user keeps making guesses until they get it correct, right, based on this feedback, right. Now, I go to a lot of effort showing, you know, what a run of the game might look like. Hello, let's play Mastermind. I'm thinking of a secret code that consists of four digits where each digit is between one and five. That's harder than that version. That looked like it only had four colors. I could be wrong about that. Remember, a digit is correct if it's in the right place. It's misplaced if the digit is in the code but not in the correct place. Let's play. All righty, round one. Take your guess. Five, five, five. Now let's uh, go and scroll down and find out what the real answer one is. Five, four, four, three. Okay, we're just going to keep that tucked in my mind. Nope, that's not the correct answer. It's 54321. 54321. Okay, so they guessed 5555. There's one in the correct place, right? Because if the real answer is 5432, there's one in the right place. How about 4444? There's also one in the right place. How about all threes? Yes, there's a three in there. How about all twos? Yes, one of them is correct. How about all ones? Well, 5432 doesn't contain any ones, so there's none that are correct and there's none that are misplaced. All right, how about 5544? Well, it was 5432. So there's a 5 in the right place. 4, well, that's not in the right place. 4, yeah, there is a 4 in the answer, but it's not in the right place, so that counts as a misplaced. So there's one correct and there's one misplaced. And so on. You keep guessing... And then I implemented a little history function where if you tip, do H, it displays all of that just so that you can see, you know, how it works. And we would implement that with what's known as an array list, which we learn how to use after we learn about arrays, which is our next chapter. I'm really eager to get to arrays. I'm tired of talking about objects, but objects are awfully important. All right, and so finally they get it right. All right, and that's something called the Hungry Monster Array. A hungry monster array, I'm just going to scroll down to the end. Well, you make an array, a two-dimensional array, and you fill it with some numbers. It's mostly zeros, but then there's some other numbers too. And then you send a monster, represented by a hash symbol or something like that, looking for the highest value. 
So what do I mean? All right, I'm just going to go and show you the, uh, the results. All right, so here's our starting array, right? I just represented zeros with dots to make it easier to read. Here's the highest value. That's where the monster's going to go. Now the monster starts at that position. So the monster's on the move. The monster wants a 7. We scan the whole array looking for the highest value. We know that that's it. It's looking for the 7. It knows what position it's in. It somehow, it does a check to determine where it's going to move next. So, in this algorithm, it moved one to the right. And then it moved another to the right. Now, it's, it's up to you to kind of determine the logic for it. Is it going to go right all the way until it's in the right column, and then is it going to start going down? Well, I made this one kind of go diagonal. It's still looking for the 7. It almost there. And then finally it gets it. The monster ate the 7. Now it needs to pick a new target. It looks for the next highest value. It finds a 6. Okay, that's what it's going to look for. The monster's on the move. This time it wants a 6. And so on. It keeps doing that until there are nothing but zeros and 1s in the array. Because the 1 represents the monster and the zeros represent the empty things. Now P fighter. This is kind of long. This program will implement a combat system for an imaginary game called P Fighter. Now, those of y'all who took my scripting class have seen this one before. Read the document carefully, including the sample of a complete battle. All right. So the way the way it works is you create a character. You give the character a name, a combat rating called CR for the rest of the document, armor, and attack dice. Now, if you've ever played games where you're attacking, you know, each other like Dungeons and Dragons or something like that, you're kind of familiar with the idea. Or if you've played video games, you know, and, and you've got two characters wailing away at each other like Street Fighter 2, you know, so the combat rating is their health, like the health bar at the top of your game. The armor is how much damage they can take. So, like, if they're supposed to take 10 points of damage, but their armor rating is 3, 10 minus 3 is they take 7 damage. And attack dice is how many each one gets to attack. So if I have two warriors, one named Fred and one named Barney, and they both get to roll two dice, he rolls a seven, he rolls a nine, well, he got two higher than him. But say that they both had an armor rating of three. He was supposed to take two hits, but the armor absorbed it all. So nobody took any hits, and then the next round begins. Now, if you set the armor too high when you create these characters, then they'll sit there and they'll wail away at each other forever, and neither one will take any damage. And I'd like for you to figure out a rule that would fix that, right? Maybe their armor degrades over time. Like if they play more than 10 turns, their armor starts decaying. Or, you know, maybe there's some kind of special attack if, uh, if somebody, you know, rolls you know, maxes, like if they were rolling two dice and they got two sixes or whatever, then you get those hits anyways, whatever. You know, you, you can come up with some rule that'll prevent infinite battles. And then I give a long explanation of what it's supposed to do, but here's how it works. You determine their attacks in order, in other words, they roll their dice. You compare the attacks to determine the loser. Did Fred roll more or less than Barney? You calculate the damage, the difference of the two. Fred rolled a 9, Barney rolled a 7, then Barney's supposed to take 2 hits, right, because 9 minus 7 is 2. Then you calculate the real damage. You take that 2 and you compare it to the armor, right? If the armor rating was only 1 and you were supposed to take 2, 2 minus 1 is you would take 1 hit. And then you apply that to, the, to their health, to the CR. Now I put as a bonus in here so that the attack dies gets a bonus equal to half of the health rating of whatever. You could leave that out until you got the rest of it implemented, or you could build it in for right from the beginning, right? So if Fred's health rating is 10 and Barney's health rating is 8, well, half of 10 is 5, so when Fred rolls, you know, he gets to add 5 to his roll. And Barney's health rating is 8, so when he attacks, he gets to add half of that 4 to his roll, and then the, then the decision is made. Once somebody starts losing, they lose real fast in this game, right? Because your challenge rating starts going down, and since you get a bonus based on your dice, based on the challenge rating, yeah, okay. Anyway, so you can watch my sample run here. This is like the longest description here. 
I don't think that the description needed to be this long, but each time people did the project, they wanted more explanation, so I kept adding to it. Here's a sample run. I added a cute little history as far as I thought it was cute, right, showing that Conan here started off with that challenge rating, and then as he kept playing, it went down a little bit. Trogdar started off with more, but he must have been rolling fewer dice than Conan because at a certain point he took some hits and then he was defeated. All right. So you can see that that's the longest one. I could come up with others if you all wanted one. If you all want, didn't like these or if you can come up with an idea. If you come up with an idea, make sure it's something you can do. Don't say I'm going to write you know, a video game that implements you know, Fortnite you know, and Java. You know, don't make it a huge project. Make it something you can actually complete and then email it to me, and I'll look at it, and I'll have suggestions, or I'll say, this looks great. What is this doing again? End of semester. Yeah. But don't wait until the last week to do it. I ought to assign little mini checkpoints, right? I ought to say you ought to have a project design document, you know, and be ready in four weeks, and you ought to have this, and you ought to have that. I'm going to trust you all. I may, have, I may put a, a deadline for you all to upload something just so I can see what you've done. That'd probably be a good idea, but I'm not going to make you create a design document beforehand because what people would do is they would copy the assignment, paste it in a design document, and they'd add a couple of lines. I've seen that before. We're not going to do that. All right. Any of those look fun? Anybody psyched up? Wave your hand if you... No, no one's waving a hand. All right, I see some hands going up. Two is going, please no. All right. So anyway, I can work with y'all. If anybody doesn't like any of these, then we can come up with other ones. And I try to arrange these in increasing difficulty. So Caesar Cipher and Exclusive Wars are probably the simplest ones. Just saying. And that's okay to pick those as opposed to the harder ones? Or yeah, you can pick a simple one. <laughs> And if you get done with it, like in two hours, you might think, well, that one was too easy. I'm going to do another one. Right. And yeah, I'll make that offer that if you do two projects, you get extra credit and you can blow away, you know, one of your homework assignments if you missed a homework assignment. I'm not expecting a lot of people to do that. But if you tackle one and it turns out that, that you know, some of y'all are, are pro programmers and you may be able to, you know, to crank one of these out in a couple hours. All right, back to objects. Back to objects. So when we're creating an object, the first thing we do is we dictate the type that it is, and then we create a reference to it. That's called a declaration. This is my object type, and this is my reference. Now, right now, it's not referring to anything, right? We could even put the word equals null in there to indicate that it's not pointing at anything. Behind the scenes, it's got zeros in it or whatever. This is the address in memory that it's pointing to. So we have some variable called Gus, and then there's some other memory that can hold objects, but he doesn't got one yet. And then when we say Gus is equal to new mouse, it creates a new object, puts it out over here, and then it puts the address of that object in this variable. So that from now on, when we need to access that object, Gus knows where it is in memory. <coughs> and you can mix these, and you can combine these. You don't have to do a declaration and instantiation. Do you remember if we said you do a declaration in one line and an, and an init and, I don't want to use the word, and an assignment in the second line? Then you can do both of those things, and it's called initializing. I don't know why we had to come up with a fancy <laughs> word for that, but there it is. Bless you. So after you instantiate an object, using that new keyword instantiates the object, until you do new, we don't have an object. We just have a kind of an empty reference, right? Then we can call the instance methods using its syntax, gus.grow, reference variable dot method name. And since it's a method, it's going to have parentheses, and it may have arguments between the parentheses. So these are just functions that are attached to the object. These are instance methods, so that they required an instance. They required a reference. 
instance means that it was declared as non-static. So the calling object is the object that appears to the left of the dot. Gus is our calling object. When we use a scanner, scanner in equals new scanner, and then we call next int. In dot next int. In is the calling object. So here's their scanner, stdin. That's the calling object when we call next double. And when we call gus.grow, gus is the calling object. Gus is a reference. It's pointing to a mouse object that was created, that was instantiated here. stdin is a reference. It's referring to, it's got the address of a scanner that was created out in memory. So the, this reference, if you're inside the object, you can use the same syntax, a dot, but instead of an object name in front of it, a reference name, you just put this. And that means that the variable or the function that follows is a member of that class. So inside the class, we can do this dot wait, and every time they call grow, it's going to increase by that amount of weight. That's why our getters and setters kind of look like that. Right, if we have a circle class, if I can type, and it's got a radius, then when we make a getter for it, it has to be of the same type. Well, I guess it doesn't have to be. And in get radius, it doesn't need to accept any values, and it returns this dot radius. In this particular case, you don't need this dot because there's no name confusion. Now, if you're going to put a setter in there, it's not going to return a value, or at least it doesn't have to. Set radius, and we pass a value in. And so we set this dot radius equal to radius. Now, the reason that we used the, this reference is because otherwise we do have name conflict, right? If we just said radius equals radius, it wouldn't change that. So getter, fancy term for them, or accessor. Setter, fancy word for that is mutator. And then we can use this variable in some get area, get circumference function. So since we provided getters and setters, we can make that private meaning that the driver class cannot access it directly. It can only access it via these methods. Now, why do you do that? So that, if need be, the setter can validate your changes to it. We might not want to allow somebody to set the radius less than zero. So we could put an if statement in here. If radius is less than zero, print an error message, else go ahead and do the assignment. Now, in that case, we might want to return a true or false based on whether it succeeded or not, rather than avoid. So the idea behind putting getters and setters in there, that's called encapsulation. You're trying to keep your data valid at all times. You can validate your data during the setting, make sure that they're giving good values. And if need be, then the data types could change behind the scenes without him even knowing about it. Right? Suppose we decide to put some other kind of, of tracker in here, not only radius, but some uh, flag to indicate whether it was a valid circle or not. Well, we could put that in there and then set radius. The user doesn't even, the, uh, you, when I say the user, the programmer who comes after you or you yourself doesn't even have to know how this data is stored inside memory. They just need to know the syntax. If you change it so that uh, you're stored as a long, great, you could do that. If you change it so that it floats it into a change, it stores it as a double, great, you can do that. You probably ought to change these data types as well. But it'll be probably pretty clean if you do that. The calling code wouldn't have to change. You know, if you made it accept a double rather than an int, all of that ought to work. So that's called encapsulation. You're trying to keep your data safe from the calling code. And when I say safe, to try to stop you or another programmer from making mistakes and setting the data into an invalid state, invalid values. All right, and then we're going to use that. Int, well, I guess when we calculate the circumference, since it's going to involve pi, 
I better make it a double. So get circumference. It doesn't accept any variables, it's, but it's going to return 2 pi r. So 2 times math.pi times the radius, or this dot radius. Either one would work. There's no naming conflict, so I don't need the, this reference in front of it. Okay. Notice I did not create an area variable up here. I did not go, okay, private double area, and I'm going to have a function that calculates the area, and I'm going to have another one that returns. No, you never want to store, well, I won't say never. You usually do not want to store a calculated value as a member of the class. It seems efficient, but what really happens is if the radius changes, then the data is stale in the area and the circumference are no longer valid. And so you would have to make it so that every time they called set radius, you would also have to call set area and set, you know, circumference. You'd have to recalculate those values every time you change this. And instead, we're only recalculating the value right when we want to know it. So it's more, far more efficient and less risky to your code to not put calculated values here. So if we're going to use this class in our driver, now this is obviously not the syntax, right? Public static void name, right? Whatever. Then the driver would create a circle, right? Circle C1 is equal to new circle. And then we would set the value, but I could not do this, c1.radius is equal to 10, instead I have to call the setter, so c1.setRadius, 10, and then you could use it, double, you know, circ is equal to c1.getCirc, like that, then we could print it out. So your block class, you had three variables rather than one, right? You were setting the width and the height and the depth. And you had two results you could return. You could return the surface area and the volume of them. So your code, your driver, would need to set those three variables, and then it would need to call those two functions so that it could display the volume and the surface area. All right. And you have to do all that. You could make a class that was just data, right, and had nothing else in it. In the C language, that's called a structure. Well, in the C language, you don't even have classes. In C++, you call that a structure, struct. So you can make a class that only has data, right? We could make a rectangle class that only had data, right? Int, depth, you know, height, width, and depth. And then every time you wanted to calculate the volume, you could do that in main, right? You know, down here in main, uh, you know, rect r is equal to new rect, right? And then you set r dot h equal to 20, and you set r dot, you know, whatever, width equal to 10, and you set r dot height, you know, I think I've already done that. Depth is equal to, you know, three. And then you calculate the volume right on the spot, Double volume is equal to r dot height times r dot width times r dot depth. This is valid programming. It's not object-oriented programming, now. Object-oriented is the idea of taking these kind of stuffs and making them part of the rectangle class. Oh, I guess if it's a rectangle, it doesn't have a depth. and it doesn't have a volume, right? So we're just going to say double area is equal to height times width. So to make it more object-oriented, we would take this calculation and we would put it here. So double get area, and then we would perform that calculation and return it, like that. Now that is valid object-oriented programming. If you watch that video, they talked about, you know, putting too much stuff in, putting getters and setters where they're not required, you know, or letting your IDE generate a whole bunch of getters and setters because you don't need it. I want you to know how to do this stuff so you can choose to ignore it, right? Just like that video made fun of putting too many comments in, you know, if you write your code clean enough and the comments are kind of unnecessary, well, I want you to be putting comments in anyways 
so that when you can become a professional programmer, you know when you ought to be doing it and you know when you sh don't need to bother. And when you don't need to bother is when the code is clear enough. That, but you can't ever really say that the code is going to be clear enough that the person does Like, if you were going to do that one where we were going to do the uh, exclusive or, you might want to break it up into sections based on comments. Get input from user. Don't make a huge block, right? You know, you don't have to, you know, you know, flag it or whatever, but get input from user, and then you have a couple of lines of data that uses a scanner to get the input from the user. And then convert string to array of ints, right? And so then you have some code that does that, you know, or convert string to array of ASCII values, something like that. And then, you know, exclusive or whatever our array name, that array into array two, right? And then you have some lines of code. And then you have exclusive or array two into array three. And we might say exclusive or 111 to indicate what we were doing, right? And that way, no matter how complex this code is, we know what it's supposed to do. If I showed you the code that I was using for exclusive or, then, you know, it, it might not make any sense. Especially when I was doing the Caesar cipher, that the, uh, the transformations for it looked a little bit alien, right? But if I comment it, then, then, you know, boom, you know what it is. Oh, and by the way, I should mention, while we were talking about these ors and ands, what we're doing here is called bitwise or. This is known as a bitwise and, and this is known as a bitwise exclusive or. There's no logical exclusive or in this language. I've never used any language that had a logical exclusive or, but they all had bitwise. The operators for them, so bitwise or is a single bar, not two bars. A bitwise and is a single ampersand, not two ampersands. And a bitwise exclusive or is a shift six, a carrot, right, a little hat. So, you know, x is equal to one, two, three, exclusive or four, five, six, whatever, right? It compares all the bits, it does its little magic, and it would get stored in the x. Anyways, so yeah, I hope you got some good stuff out of that video. And just realize that the stuff they were saying don't do, you need to know how to do before you choose not to do it. So I do recommend commenting your code, even though they were making fun of the way that people comment your code. Just learn that you need to comment it judiciously. You don't go overboard. You don't comment every line. You don't put huge boxes around your comments, whatever. You just try to make the code as easy to read as possible. The computer doesn't care how easy to read it is, but you and the next programmer does do. So default values. In your class, you can specify default values. Or you can let its constructor assign default values. Remember I had my circle class here in the notes? And I had a rectangle class up here in my notes? If I wanted to, I could assign some default values. Right? I could say that until proven otherwise, the height of it is 1 and the width of it is 1. There, I have some default values. So every rectangle that gets created has a height and a width of 1 until otherwise assigned. Or I can make a constructor that sets those things. So like on my circle up here, I can make a constructor that sets radius. And so a constructor has the same name. It's a method with the same name as a class with no return type that is called by the new keyword or when the object is instantiated. Okay, so I'm going to make a constructor. It ought to be declared public. In fact, all these methods ought to be public, right? Because my rules were data private, methods public. 
So public, circle, that's the name of the class. You could put some parameters in there if you want to do. I'm just going to say that when a radius, when a circle is created, it has a default radius of 1. Now, is there an argument for doing it that way over the other way? And I'd say no. I don't see any advantage to writing a constructor to replace the default constructor that Java gives you. Because Java gives you a default constructor. It just doesn't do anything. It just sets all the variables equal to zero. But if you want to, you can also write a parameterized constructor. A parameterized constructor lets you get away from calling set radius. You can make a second circle like this. Circle C2 is equal to new circle, and I'm going to put in a radius of 10, right? Now I don't have to call set radius. It was already set as it was created. But to do that, I have to provide a custom constructor. I have to add a default constructor. So back I'm going to find my circle class, wherever that was. I'm going to put in a second constructor that accepts a parameter so that it can set that radius. Public circle... And then it accepts a radius so that we can set this dot radius equal to that value. Now you may be tempted to just call set radius right here instead, right? Set radius parentheses radius. And that means, if I'm recalling right, that means gives you an obscure warning about that. And I don't remember what it is. But if you just set the values like that, it doesn't give you a warning. So the reason you use custom constructors is if it makes the class easier to use. Like down here when I was, here's my rectangle code. When I was creating a rectangle, I might want to make a separate rectangle. R2 is equal to new rect. And then I could fill in 20 and 10 as the height and the width, right? And then I wouldn't need to call the two setters like, or, you know, this thing didn't even have setters. But you get the idea, right? I could have done it like that. My rectangle class doesn't have a custom constructor, so I'm not going to do that. Out in the real world, you'll see people implement classes like this where they're not making the data private, and they're not providing getters and setters, and they're just accessing it like that. And it's not like there's a great big law against it, and the ghosts of all the programmers who've ever died are going to come curse you if you don't do that. But you may work in a place that mandates that the data is private, you know. The larger the project, the more strict you want to get about access to these things. Because if you have 20 people working on a team or this code is being maintained over decades, you want to make it as hard for them to mess up as possible. And so if you can provide getters and setters and data validation and stuff like that to try to make it as... That's why you're writing classes to begin with. It's to make reusable code that you can then pre bring into a project and it's already pretty much proven to work so you don't have to sweat it. Now all these examples about calculating you know, volumes and stuff like that, those are pretty easy calculations, but it's just to illustrate the point. We could take the circle class into another project you know, and then it would work. We wouldn't have to rewrite those calculations. Classes can include other classes. Like say you declare a point class and a point has two things, int x and y. And when you create a point, you can set its x and y values. And then now that we're going to create a circle, oh, by the way, I guess I should have used the class keyword. When I create a circle class, not only am I going to set a variable called the radius, I'm going to create a variable called origin. Now that's a null reference at this point. It's an uninitialized reference, right? So that's kind of bad. We probably ought to have a constructor in this case so that it could set the x and the y of that point, so it could create a point. So I might want to add a constructor in this case. You know, circle, you know, and it might take the radius, int r for the radius, int x, and then int y. And it could do all of that. It could set this dot radius. I should not have put that semicolon there. It could set this dot radius equal to the value that was passed in. It could create a new point, right? 
origin is equal to new point, and it could set the x and the y values of that of that point, right? Origin dot x equals x, origin dot y is equal to y, right? Or we make point have a constructor, so we could create a new point like this, right? And so, anyways, now we have a circle that not only has a radius, it has a position on screen, like we were going to make a graphics program. Get rid of that. You can have classes, objects that are inside of objects that are inside of objects. Yeah. We're going to be drawing something that's a group of circles, right? Well, so that class has elements of type circle. And the circle type has points, right? You might define a triangle as something that has three points, right? Then if you ever need to change your point class so that it, it uh, can use three space rather than just two space, then you might be able to go in and just add a third data element to it. And that might not even change, you know, your existing code. As long as you write your code cleverly enough so that it's encapsulated so that it's okay for it to only use X and Y, but that if they need a Z element as well, they can. So if you encapsulate your code rather than letting this code set everything directly and use it and stuff like that, because what if we want to write something that will calculate the distance between two points? And so we write a class that will do that. And then so we might put a distance to method in here that would accept another point. I'm going to go ahead and sketch that out, but I'm not going to calculate it, right? So distance to, it would take another point, right? And then uh, using you know, x squared plus y squared equals, you know, z squared. So you take the square root of all that, you know, calculate the distance and then return it. Okay, that's great, right? Later on, we decide that we also want to support three space, right? So we're going to allow, you know, a Z coordinate as well. Well, in that case, if all of the other code was calculating distances based just on X and Y, and they were setting them and getting them directly, then you would have to go back and modify all that code. Whereas if you just modify it so that distance to We'll use that Z axis information if it's there, and we'll ignore it if it's not. Then when you implement that Z quantity in there, then the code's not going to break your existing code. Right. You have encapsulated it rather than letting it manipulate the guts in here directly and perform calculations that should have properly have been done inside the class. So default values for variables, they default to zero, effectively. Boolean gets false, but that's kind of a zero, right? Ints get zero, floating point types get 0.0, .0. reference types get null. So until the new keyword is used, then the value of a reference type is null if it's defined in a class. So string is a reference type, so it gets null until you set it equal to something. We've kind of already talked about this. A variable's persistence is how long a value survives until it is wiped out. So you have main, and then inside main you have an if statement, right? If x is equal to 3, and if that's the case, then we calculate some kind of y. Int is equal to 2 times x, right? And then down here we try to print. You know, System.out.println, we try to print. Whoops, I forgot my y. Looks like we're not going to have anything to submit. I haven't made y'all type in anything yet. Scary. Okay, so, right, this is not going to work. His lifespan, his persistence, is from between here and here. If you wanted this to work, you would have to declare int beforehand. All right. That's still not going to work, by the way. Why? Because, well, obviously we haven't declared x, right? But whatever. Um, when we get down to here, it's possible that y has not been set. Correct? Mm -hmm. So, the compiler is not going to let that slide. 
C and C++ would let it slide probably and it would just print out whatever random memory that that you know happened to be pointing to. So, but anyways, now the persistence of that variable is from here to here. But this is actually part of a class, right? Class, you know, whatever. And this has got to be public static, you know, void. Gee, if I was doing this in an editor, it'd be easy. Okay, if this has a variable, I'm going to make it a static variable because, as I've said before, if something is declared as void, it can only access other things inside that same class if they are also void. Now replace that word void with static because I just said that wrong. If something is declared static as main is, then it can only access other static elements of the same class. So anyways, public, static, void, you know, age, right? This thing's lifespan is forever, as long as the program runs, right? You can use it in this function, you can use it in another function down here, you know, public static, void, you know, do something, whatever. You know, if we feel like setting age in here, we could do that, right? Age is equal to three, whatever. And then another function was supposed to print it out, it would work. So the persistence of that, its lifespan, its lifetime, its scope is between here and here. Now this variable always exists because it's static. It exists even if we do not instantiate a version of this class. But if you make a variable that is non-static, then that variable only exists when you create an object, right? This circle, it's not static. So its radius is only created when you create a new circle, right? So down here, when we make a new circle, circle CC is equal to new circle you know, radius of 10, or wait, you know, it's x position is 10, it's y position is 20, and it's a radius, whatever, you know. These variables get created when the circle is instantiated. And they stay around as long as that object exists. But eventually, the object may stop existing. How might it stop existing? Well, what if it was inside this if block, right, like that? This is called, or one of the terms for it, is falling out of scope. The scope of this variable, its lifetime, is between these two braces. And when I say this variable, I mean this reference. So when we get out of here, when we leave that, this is now an orphan object. There's no references to it because this variable gets deleted, right? Its memory is free. Now this object stays around. Nothing deleted it. That's why Java and Python and a lot of other languages, C Sharp, have what's known as a garbage collector. When an object becomes orphaned, when nothing is referring to it anymore, the garbage collector goes and releases the memory for it. In languages like C and C++ without garbage collection, then you have to free that object before the reference to it disappears. You have to release that memory yourself, and that's what makes C++ and C programming a little bit more particular because you have to manage your memory yourself. Now, as they continue to add new standards, they're always adding new standards to C++. They have come out with, you know, forms of smart pointers and, you know, that do their own kind of primitive object, you know, um, garbage collection and stuff like that. But anyways, the lifespan of this variable is between here and here. When we get to here, CC no longer exists. Now these variables exist still, that object still exists, but there's no way to access it and the garbage cleaner will come and free that memory. You just have no idea when that's gonna happen. Is it gonna happen one nanosecond later or is it gonna happen 10 seconds later? It doesn't really matter to you because this data is now gone. You know, the radius is now gone, the origin point is now gone, or it's inaccessible. It's been orphaned, there's no way to get to it. So like, if we say that a reference is an address, and so I have a house, and I give you an address, you know how to get to my house, but then you lose the address, well, I still have a house, but it's now an orphan house. You have no idea how to get there. Maybe I still have the address. You can have more than one reference to the same object, but if I lose the address as well, then neither one of us knows where the house is, and so it's useless. Eventually, the garbage collector will come, and he'll tow our house away. Whatever, that's where my example kind of breaks.
breaks down. So instance variables persist for the duration of the particular object. If an object makes two method calls, the second method call does not reset the calling object's instance variable. Right? When we call get area on this circle way up here, we never did. <laughs> right? Double A is equal to, you know, R dot get area. And then later on, we call some other function. We didn't write it, but r dot get you know parameter. It doesn't change the data. It doesn't create new height and width variables. All of that stuff was created when we created the object. And these instance members persist until the object goes away, until all references to it are gone. And in this case, the references are not going to be gone until the end of main. And when it hits the end of main, it starts running a, you know, a shutdown process that releases all the memory anyways. But if this is a function other than main, when it hits the end of that function, then this object, R, goes away, and these variables go away. So, instance variables retain their values from one method call to the next, right? I can call get area, and then I can call get circumference, the same radius was still there. I didn't have to reset it. No. 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 There's a logic error. In the regular slide it said there's a logic error. We can go look. There's a logic area here. We incidentally, accidentally forgot to initialize the growth rate. So we created a mouse but when we called to grow, we had never set the growth rate. There's no default value for the growth rate inside the mouse class. So it's not going to work. We should have set the growth rate. We did here for Gus. When we created Gus, we set a, a growth rate there. But when we created Jackie, or Jack, you, then we did not set the growth rate. He is in an invalid state at that point. That is one argument for making constructors, right? If you have to specify a growth rate for every mouse you create, then you put that data in the constructor so that when the programmer creates the mouse, it has specified the growth rate. They cannot create a mouse without specifying a growth rate and then you don't have that logic error. So that was a good catch. I'm glad you mentioned that. All right, I think the question came up, how do you do a UML for a constructor? Well, UMLs can get extraordinarily complex, but here we go. This is how this person does it. They just don't put the return type, right? I told you to put void if it's declared as void. This person's not putting void on their things that don't return a value. The reason I like to put void is it differenti differentiates between constructors and functions that are declared void. Remember? Constructors are not declared void. They just don't have a return type at all because they're, they don't return anything. Instead, they're being called as the object is created. So if I was going to write a constructor, excuse me, a UML for one of my classes here, like uh, where was one of the cool ones? This one's pretty cool because it has, you know, a constructor. It has another constructor. and has a get radius. Forgive me for doing this, but I'm going to... that, you know, I'm going to condense this so that it fits on a single page. Well, that kind of, my comments here are messing that little goal up. All right, anyways, the UML. What's the first line of the UML besides the dashes? The class name. Right. All right, and then... What's the second block of data? The product members. 
Yeah, so our instance oh, members are, well, we've only got one. So we've got a radius. It's a type int, and it's declared as private. So I'm going to put a minus sign in front of it. And I'm going to say radius, and it's a type int. And then the third section are the members. Now, in this case, I have several members. I have one, two, three, four, five. I have two. I have a getter and a setter and a get circumference. For some reason, I didn't calculate a get area. And I had two constructors. OK. So the, my setter did not return any data. And it was public. So set radius. Didn't return anything, so I declared a type void, and it accepted a parameter, which was a type int. My getter did return something. It returned an int. And it didn't accept any parameters. You can trust me. All right, and then we had another one, get circumference. It did return a value. What did it return? I made it return a double. Did it have any parameters? No, because when you call get circumference, it's using the radius it's already set. All right, and then we had two constructors, one called circle, and then another one that took a radius. Like that. And they don't return type void, they don't return anything. And so that's the UML for our circle class. Now, I've done a lot of talking without ever asking if anybody has any questions. And I know what's going to happen when I ask, are there any questions? I'm going to have stupefied you with all this talking, and you're not going to have any questions in mind. That said, are there any questions? Did you say you get radius return to any? Yeah, it does. Here, I said, trust me, I was wrong. If I had gone up here and looked, Git Radius does actually return an int. Thank you. You earned you massive the brownie you said, points. You said it right. You just typed it yeah. Oh, okay. Like All right. All right. Okay, cool. I looked up constructor, and it didn't have, it just had like int. It didn't have the radius to in it. I mean, it had, just had to type and not the variable You can name. do that. You can leave off the variable names. That's valid. That's valid. I like the variable names because they give you information about why we're passing data into it, right? I mean, if I scroll up here, I can see, oh, well, that's probably setting that value. But I think variable names are useful information. Okay. The same concept applies in C++, where when you're defining a function, you can define a prototype for it. And if you feel like it, you can leave the data types off. You can say, OK, I'm going to write a function called silly. And oh, it takes a string, and it takes an int, and it takes a float. And so I'm going to put that in my header file. And, you know, and, oh, Well, great. Now that I've got your header file, I have no idea what these do. I don't even have the source code to look to figure out what silly is right, and what it's supposed to do. So variable names are very useful. That's why I go ahead and put them in the UML, but you're very correct. You don't have to. You have to if you're giving it to me. No, I'm kidding. I wouldn't count it wrong. <laughs> More questions? I guess I'll make some random points. Put your classes in their own files. I've already said that before. Don't define classes as part of your main driver class. Unless you have a real, real, real good reason. Because you can define classes as part of classes. And that's an advanced tech tactic. So what usually happens is when I tell somebody to go and then make a circle class, the first thing they do is they create their project and they call it circle. And then they have a circle.java. 
and then they start thinking, well, my circle needs a radius, and so they add an int radius to their one with their main method, and then they and then they go insane because they can't get it to work. So instead, create a project, and then if I tell you to make a class, make that as a separate file. You put all that data in it. So if I tell you to define three classes, right, car, bus, and boat, make a project that's not call either car, bus, or boat, then add those three classes to that project. The class with main will have a different name. And be in its own file. Now, actually, I don't think anybody's been doing this in this class. Right? If you accidentally created one named car, then um, you, you, you know, you, tr you veered and you made the class separate, but you called it something else like vehicle. Right? So, car was your driver class. Weird to say that. And then you had another class called vehicle, which had the members for the car class that I was writing up here. And that's okay. You did have the idea that these classes are separate from what I call the main class, the project class. Let me show you something involving NetBeans, and then we're going to be done because we only have two minutes left. Sometimes NetBeans gets confused about where your main is. You could create a project that had 17 main methods, one in each project, one in each class you make. Then you have to tell NetBeans which class has the main method that you want to use. So over here in projects, I'm just going to pick one lecture at random. If I come over here and I click inside the projects and I choose properties, then if I look where it says run, I get to specify which is my main class, which is the class with my main method. If I have a different class with a main method, or I move my main method from one to the other, or I accidentally delete that file and I, re and I recreate it and this thing no longer points to it, then it will not run. It'll compile, but it won't run. It'll give you an error. It may bring up a dialogue asking you, you know, which class it, the main method is in. But you can always click Browse, and as long as NetBeans isn't terminally confused, it will list all of the classes in your project that have main methods. Now, is it a great idea to create multiple classes with main methods? I don't know. Um, maybe you have a, a reason for doing that. All I know is that you have to do that more often than, than, than you might expect. Go in and pick a new main method for your project. All right, let's stop there. There's not even anything to upload. Bummer. Okay. But everybody's here, so um, when I record attendance, everybody's here. All righty. And did I have any homework I want to inflict on you? I love that term, inflict. We're off Thursday, right? We're off Thursday. Is that a project folder visible? It is visible, but it's at the very bottom. Okay. I'll reorder it so that it's at the top. Now, I'm not going to give you any homework. Enjoy the break, but you might look at the projects and come up, you know, for kind of a thought about which one, you know, makes you happy to look at. All right, so I'll see you all Tuesday. Remember, Thursday's a break day. So, so it's Friday, but not Wednesday. So there's nothing to post for today's lecture? Nothing to upload. I mean, I could make a Dropbox, but not everybody typed in notes. Right, so. If you want, I'll make one. No, I'm sorry. All right. No, I'm serious. But if you like uploading all your notes and you type some in, and it would be of use. Unsupported operation yeah. exception not supported yet. What happened is, is you accidentally create, here I'll show you. Say that, uh, there's one of my most recent ones with classes. Uh, 
So here, right, and then I have some turtle that I created. I guess I commented everything mm -hmm. out. T dot set depth ten, and I don't really have a set depth class. Oh. And so I came over here and I did create. Yeah. Don't ever choose create. Here's what okay. happens. Here's what. Oh, I should have called T one. Anyways, because what happens is, yeah. yeah. If I do that, then I have to go and I have to find that method inside my triangle class. Now that's not too hard. I can right click on triangle and do mm -hmm. navigate, go to source. Eventually I will find that there. I let NetBeans create this method, mm -hmm. but it didn't know what to do with it, so it made some code in there that breaks your code. So you have to go and you have to find in your class mm -hmm. this statement throw new unsub and you need to replace it with the code that you really wanted to do. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So really if you just do control F and look for unsupported, then uh, you know you'll find where it's doing that and you can replace it with good code. Okay. Gotcha. Thank sure. you. Sure thing. I think I might do for the project is something that's like that wasn't even that game. Mastermind? Oh yes. However, I'm going to make I'm going to think enough to change it to have a four digit number with any digits. Yeah, yeah, and that'd be cool. That'd similar, make it harder. Yeah, <laughs> it's like a random similar to a random similar to that random game we played except instead of being told what's wrong to load these it says these digits. I like that idea. I may also cut the use I might also give the user a certain number of guesses before. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if it can yeah, be any digit that. rather than just numbers one through four, it's going to be harder for the person to guess. Yeah. That's going to be kind of fun.